fill United States Senator Jim Inhofe's seat. Inhofe is retiring after 28 years in office. So tonight, the top two Republican candidates in that race are here for a one-hour debate on all the issues that are important to Oklahomans and the country. Mark Wayne Mullen and T.W. Shannon, thank you both for joining us tonight. And before we get to the questions, let's get to know more about the candidates who want your vote on August 23rd. Mark Wayne Mullen shifted gears in 2012 and went from being an Oklahoma businessman to representing Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District. He's currently serving his fifth term. Mullen is a member of the Cherokee Nation. He and his wife, Christy, have been married for more than 25 years. They, along with their six children, live on a ranch in their hometown of Westville, Oklahoma. T.W. Shannon served for 10 years in the Oklahoma House of Representatives and was named the state's first African-American Speaker of the House in 2013. He was the youngest person to ever hold that position. Shannon is a Lawton native and also a member of the Chickasaw Nation. He's been married for more than 20 years to his wife, Devin, and they have a son and a daughter. So here are the general rules for tonight's debate. Candidates will have one minute and 15 seconds to respond to each question. As the moderators, we will allow rebuttal responses of up to 45 seconds at our discretion. We have asked the candidates not to interrupt one another, and each candidate will be allowed two minutes for a closing statement. The order of those closing statements was determined earlier this evening by a coin toss. Griffin Media is the parent company of News 9 and News on 6 and has its own independent Washington, D.C. Bureau focusing on topics and issues that affect our state and our citizens. Bureau Chief Alex Cameron will join us live to also ask the candidates some questions. And our Craig Day is standing by at our digital desk to bring us viewer questions and reaction from the virtual audience tonight as well. So. Here we go. Finally, we are to the questions. We're going to have our first question now. The Department of Justice is investigating Donald Trump as part of its January 6th probe. It appears Mr. Trump is the presumptive leader of this Republican Party, and both of you are big supporters of his, and he has endorsed Mr. Mullen. We want to ask a series of questions to find out what your degree of support for him is and our Republican voters who will be voting in this runoff. First, was the 2020 presidential election a lie, and do you think Donald Trump won the last election? Mr. Shannon, let's start with you. Well, first I want to say thank you to the viewers who are watching. Thank you to News 6 and News 9 for having us, and thank you, Congressman, for joining us tonight. Uh, I will tell you, uh, when we look at what happened on January 6, and even going before that, with the election of 2020, there's no question that the Democrats cheated. When you start using universal mail-in ballots, when you start moving the dates of when the election ballots are due, we know if you move the ballots in the middle of the election, you're cheating. That's exactly what happened. And just as if uh, when the Russian collusion charges were charged, when Hillary failed to claim uh, that, that and concede the race, she actually made the precedence of saying that the election was stolen. So yes, the act election actually was stolen. I believe that uh, wholeheartedly. We should do a full investigation to ensure election integrity. That's why in the Oklahoma legislature, I was proud to lead the effort uh, to require voter ID. We were proud uh, when I was there to require it. I think we should do it on a national level. We should require every state, a constitutional amendment to require voter ID because we have to ensure election integrity. Without it, we don't have a republic. Mr. Mullen, same question. You know, it's going to be very hard to convince me that uh, uh, Joe Biden received more election or more votes than any other president in history. Uh, it, it is absolutely absurd to think that's even possible. Uh, when, when you start looking at Donald Trump, Donald Trump was loved. Uh, if you travel across the country, people love him. They're excited about him. When, pe when he turns out, people turn out. And so when you start talking about irregularities that took place in the election, without question, we know that. And more and more and more, we're finding more details out from different states that are finally doing a deep dive and investigation into their election, saying that, hey, this election had a lot more irregularities than what we thought. What we have to do is make sure, moving forward, that we have trust in our election system. And we have to fight to make sure that every vote is counted accurately. That is an actual vote, not perception. When you have a bunch of uh, uh, Democrats that are out there every day trying to change the election laws because of their hatred towards Donald Trump, because they want to push a social agenda, we can't trust it and we know it. So you both, again, think he was cheated out of the election? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, thank you. We're going to move on to now question two. So both Republican Richard Nixon in 1960 and Democrat Al Gore in 2000 conceded a close, hotly contested election so the country would not be torn apart. So do you think Donald Trump was wrong by delaying that peaceful transfer of power, even though he had lost all of those judicial challenges? Mr. Mullen, we're going to start with you on this one, please. Or as we just stated just a second ago, there was a lot of irregularities. Uh, if you're talking about just a normal election to where it was a tight election, absolutely. I can see where you transfer, we have a peaceful transfer of power. When you start seeing the shenanigans that the Democrats pulled after state, after state, after state, in the name of, of national interest because of COVID, and they're using that to their advantage, they're changing the election laws literally 30 days out, they're doing mass mail outs, all of a sudden they find new, uh, uh, new boxes of mail-in ballots at the, after everybody goes to bed. There's a huge issue with that. If there's this many irregularities, what we have to do is make sure at the end of the day that we have voter integrity. That's why it's important that we have uh, integrity moving forward in our election system. We got to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that's right. Mr. Shannon? On the election night of 2020, I was actually in Pennsylvania campaigning for Donald Trump. I was proud to be there uh, moving forward the America First agenda. And I, first of all, I want to say I disagree with the premise of this question. Donald Trump didn't delay any election. He didn't delay a, a peaceful transfer of power. The real problem with our election, it started back in November when we had the, uh, the, the universal mail-in ballots that were allowed to, frankly, uh, disrupt the election process. You've got to take some pretty historic beliefs to believe that Joe Biden won the presidency without cheating. Number one, you've got to believe that he won Florida and Ohio. That, and you have, you have to believe that he run the presidency without winning Florida and Ohio. You also have to believe that, that uh, Joe Biden got more votes, more African-American votes, than Barack Obama. Listen, we need election integrity in this, in, in this country. It starts with voter ID. We need to require every single citizen to have an, a voter ID. It should be a constitutional amendment requiring it. Uh, it. I don't believe in a national ID. I don't believe in a federal ID at all. But we should require it because we know that the radical left is trying to allow illegal aliens to even vote in our election. We're seeing it happen in New York. And if we're not careful, it's going to happen all around the country. We should ensure election integrity. Okay, thank you both. Our next question comes to us from Alex Cameron, our Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief. Alex. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much. This is a two-part question. It has to do with January 6, 2021. First, do you believe that the storming of the Capitol and violent assault on Capitol Police was justified? Why or why not? And second, do you think President Trump should have done more and acted sooner to stop the attack? We begin with uh, T.W. Shannon. Yeah, this sounds like, you know, again, this is the problem with the radical media. We are so obsessed with this idea on January 6th. My, my campaign, we've been traveling the state. We've toured 100 cities over the last few weeks. That's what we're working toward. And I will tell you, when I talk to Oklahomans, the only thing they're asking about January 6th is what the price of gasoline was. It was $2.42 on January 6th in 2021. Uh, the truth is that everyone who broke the law on January 6th of 2021, they've been held accountable, they've been charged, and it's been amazing to me to watch watch the politicians in Washington, D.C. completely uh, move the needle about what the whole January 6th commission was about. At first, it was supposed to be out fi about finding if Donald Trump had committed, had broken a law or committed a crime. And then all of a sudden, it looks as if it has co totally acquitted, of him, acquitted him of that charge. And so now they've moved the goalpost to a point where the question has become, well, is there, is there something else? That's Did he not act fast enough? The truth is, we have an open border in this country. Uh, right now, 2.5 million illegals are poured into our country. The question should be, how long has it taken Joe Biden and the politicians in Washington, D.C. to address our open border? That's what Oklahomans care about. You know, we're 10 minutes into this election, or into this, uh, uh, this debate, and we're only focusing on Donald Trump. It's, it's frustrating to me because we're here in Oklahoma, we support President Trump, first and foremost. There's a reason why President Trump endorsed me in, in this race is because he knows I'm going to be fighting for him and America First agenda. What's wrong with putting America first? Why are we talking about January 6th? Unfortunately, I was there. Unfortunately, I was right there at the front door. It, it should never have taken place. It's frustrating to me that it took place because it took the narrative away from uh, what was happening in the election and the election uh, being stolen from President Trump 
to putting it into a debate on should President Trump do more, should he do less. The fact is the Capitol is in charge by Nancy Pelosi. The fact is that Nancy Pelosi had plenty of time to react. We know, because I said on HIPSI, on the House Permanent Select of Intelligence, we know without a doubt that Pelosi had days advance notice that it was more than intimate that, it was, that the Capitol was probably going to be attacked. And what happened? Nothing. No one's questioned her about what she did, what her reaction was. It's all focused on Donald Trump because of the fake news that's constantly being uh, reported about him. Okay, this is the final Donald Trump-related question, if that helps at all. So after January 6, both Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy condemned the president for not trying to stop it. So here are the questions for this last question in this section. Were they wrong in doing so? What's your opinion of Mike Pence, and do you think he abandoned the president in that moment? Mr. Mullen, let's start with you. Mike Pence is a good guy. Uh, I've, had, uh, I've had the privilege to travel with him. Uh, he's got a sweet spirit about him. He loves the Lord. His wife loves the Lord. Uh, and he was in a very tough spot. When you start looking at Kevin and, and Mitch McConnell, I've never talked to Mitch, so I have no idea what he was thinking. Kevin is someone that I call a friend. Uh, he, was, he was referring to the bigger picture. You know, people have a, a really good um, ability to take just one sentence that you said out of a whole paragraph to what you're reading and say this is what they're pointing to. He said that almost the same thing that I said. We all own somewhat a responsibility which took place January 6th. That means the media and the narratives they constantly drove for four years against President Trump. That means uh, politicians like Maxine Waters and, and Adam Schiff who goes out there day after day and tells the most horrific lies about President Trump. It's about other politicians going out there trying to get a headline because if it bleeds, it leads. But they only want to focus on one person and that's Donald Trump. Why? Because they know he was putting America first, and he was fighting the career politicians over and over again. That's why President Trump endorsed me, because he knows we both come up from a perspective of business, not politics. Mr. Shannon. Yeah, I want to go back to something that was asked in the first part of the question regarding Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell. Let's be clear. They are both swamp creatures. They are creatures of the swamp. And every single time an issue in this country comes, comes, comes forward that will actually advance the American people, we see time and time again the Republicans in Washington, D.C. siding with the Democrats. This is the problem with the swamp. The swamp always takes care of the swamp. And the challenge we have right now is we need someone who's going to go to Washington, D.C., who's going to actually push back, not just against the liberal Democrats, it starts there, but also against our own party. And let's make no doubt about it. Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell, they are swamp creatures. And so the very fact that they turned on President Trump, they didn't just turn on President Trump, because again, the America First agenda, it's not just about Donald Trump, it is about the American people. We are hungry for people who are going to put America first. That's what we have to have. And let's be honest, the reason we're in the mess that we're in in America right now is not just the Democrats, it's the Washington, D.C. Uh, mafia, the party bosses in both party who don't have the American people's interest at heart, they have Washington, D.C. at heart. Washington, D.C. takes care of Washington, and that's the reality that we're dealing with right now. Thank you both. So our next question is a recent News on 6, News 9 poll says inflation, jobs and the economy are by far the most important issues on the minds of our voters. So with fears a recession is on the horizon, if you are elected, name one bill you would introduce or support as U.S. Senator to address either inflation or the economy. Mr. Shannon, let's start with you. Yeah, I can't name just one bill that I'd introduce because there are three parts to this question, frankly, that we've got to address. Number one, we need to make the Trump tax cuts permanent in this country. We need to give business people and, and, and families in America uh, some, some decisions about how they're going to keep more of their money, not find a way for Washington to take more. The second part is we need to unleash American drilling. Not only was America uh, energy independent, but we were energy dominant under President Trump. And third and most importantly, uh, we've got to do our part to secure the border. That is a big issue for our country uh, right now. And actually, we see uh, right now where we have illegals coming in, nearly 2.5 million people crossed our border illegally. And that is certainly a drain on our economy. That's a drain on our system. And we need to secure our border. But also, we need to introduce a balanced budget amendment in Washington, D.C. The politicians in Washington, D.C. have continued to let the debt get out of control. Ten years ago, we were $16 trillion in debt. Today, 
we're $30 trillion in debt. And make no doubt about it, that is because of the politicians in Washington, D.C. We need a balanced budget. We need to make the Trump tax cuts permanent. And we also need to do our part to encourage drilling here in America. Simone. You know, this is why you need true citizen legislators in Washington, D.C., someone that actually understands what regulation does to a business. When you have, when you have Washington, D.C. come out and say, we've got a plan, we've got a plan to, to lower inflation, we've got a plan to create jobs, what they're saying is they're going to make government bigger. And business owners like myself, true citizen legislators that have to come back and live under those laws every day, we understand what regulation costs. If you're going to do something about inflation, roll back the cost of doing business. Every time you pass a regulation, Every time you put some more burden on a business, it's going to be pushed on down to the consumer. Let's talk about what's happening in the oil and gas industry right now. You had Joe Biden immediately, immediately reverse the policies that Trump put in place, and we saw gas going up. Why did we see gas going up? Because he reversed the policies and put more regulation on the industry. When you start looking at inflation, inflation is caused by energy because the backbone of our energy, of our economy is energy. If you have high energy, you're going to have high cost of goods because it's the beginning and end of every good. You have to understand what's happening each and every day in Washington, D.C., and you need to come home and live by those rules. That's what a citizen legislator truly does. That's why President Trump was so good and understood the policies that he was trying to put down because he understood business. Okay, we got to leave it there. We're going to move on now to another question. In recent News 9, News on 6 polling, a survey asked likely GOP primary voters about gun control measures. 43% of respondents said they agree more needs to be done. Do you agree? What legislation, if any, would you propose? Mr. Mullen, let's begin with you. Zero. The, the Second Amendment is extremely clear in this. We have the right to bear arms, and it shall not be infringed, full stop. When you start looking at, at gun control, it starts in the home. People have a tendency to fear things that they don't understand. Just like I fear taking the Metro because I don't like the subway or the Metro in Washington, D.C. I don't understand it. But my kids don't fear the gun and neither do I because when you're from rural Oklahoma, it's part of safety. If someone were, were to break into my house, which would be a long walk across a ranch to get there, but if they would, it would take 30 minutes before the sheriff could respond. 30 minutes. That's much different than what you find in maybe Boston. For us, it's a way of life. And when we start gun safety, we start our kids off with a cap gun. We move to a BB gun, and then we teach them how to clean it, we teach them how to operate it, and then we understand what it's for. It's a way of life. We don't, when we get Washington, D.C. involved in making policies, they go from the point of fear or feelings. If they wanna change it, there's a process to doing that. But right now, it doesn't give legislator legislators any room to wiggle when it says it shall not be infringed full stop mr shannon. shannon yeah so i'm a hunter and i'm a gun owner and my my son he's 13 and on his 13th birthday back in march we actually went to the gun range he my dad and myself and uh, we shot an AR-15. And the reason we did is because I want him to understand how important gun ownership is. I wanted him to understand how important safety is, but I also wanted him to have a lot of fun. Uh, we are hunters as, as a family. We've done it uh, traditionally uh, for generations. And it's very important that the po politicians in Washington, D.C. understand that this call to disarm Americans, not only does it make us less safe, but it's unconstitutional. And what we have seen is time and time again from Washington, D.C., an effort to make Americans less safe. The truth is, as, as has been mentioned before by my opponent, the Constitution says that it shall not be infringed upon. Uh, that means under any circumstances. And I haven't seen one piece of legislation that would actually make Americans safer. I haven't seen one piece of legislation that would disarm Americans and cause us to be safe or prevent any of the tragedies that we've seen thus far. Uh, in fact, I would go a step further. Perhaps it's time to have a discussion about these gun-free zones. Uh, we should maybe have a discussion about why we, are, why we are calling to disarm Americans when the Biden crime crisis is sweeping across America and Americans are less safe and they're less prosperous because of the politicians in Washington, D.C. Thank you both. So this is another weapons related question. In that same survey, 30% of those voters say they would support assault rifle bans. Another 30% supported background checks now at gun shows. 
Would you support either of those measures? Mr. Shannon, we begin with you. Absolutely not. You know, we have seen time and time again, we know what the radical left's real agenda is. It is anti-gun and it's anti-police. That's why we saw a full summer of love where, as the, where the Democrats were, and, and BLM, the black line Marxists, where they were literally uh, burning our cities down and they were using Antifa as well to, to launch crimes against Americans and to destroy neighborhoods. This is because there's an anti-police, anti-gun agenda. And again, this idea of trying to separate which weapons Americans are allowed to own and which ones we can't, the truth is most of the gun violence that we see is happening in Democrat-controlled cities and they're where they have some of the strictest gun laws and they're not keeping people safe. In order to protect your family, it's important to understand gun safety, but that does not start with the disarmament uh, from, from Washington, D.C. That starts with, with really training in the home. We need to get back to what the real cause of the violence in this country is. America's far too violent. It's because we had politicians in Washington, D.C. who was calling for violence. During the, during the campaign, uh, we saw Joe Biden and Kamala Harris talking about um, this idea of of disarming the police and disbanding the police. We should be promoting gun safety in this country, but that shouldn't start with Washington, D.C. That should start in the home. So when it comes to gun control, you both agree that not, right now nothing needs to be done? Well, I didn't get to answer that question. I was going to say, yes, you get, you get your response first right. and then yes. Right. Go ahead. That's okay. Just trying to keep you honest there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, it's, it, it, this is easy. It's not a chance. You know, this is why uh, firsthand knowledge matters. This, this is why resume matters. This is why it's important that you send somebody out there that has firsthand knowledge. You know, these individuals that you're polling, I, I'd be curious if where they live. I'd be curious if they're from Oklahoma even, because in Oklahoma, we support uh, assault rifles. We, we support the right to bear arms without question. So we have a saying in our family, you're never gonna change anything you're willing to tolerate. What's happened right now is the left is the one that is speaking for the heart of this country. The heart of this country is Oklahoma. We need to make sure that we bring more Oklahoma values to Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is trying to influence us. We need to be influencing them. That's why the resume matters, because someone with firsthand knowledge is going to fight harder for some, than someone with secondhand knowledge. And I can assure you on this issue, I have firsthand knowledge. All right, so, so again, though, let's just be clear here when it comes to gun control. You both agree right now nothing needs to be done. What, what can be done, if anything, to keep our schools, other places, safer? You have, you, first of all, I believe in the Constitution. And the Second Amendment is clear when it says you have the right to bear arms and it shall not be infringed. So it's not legislators' job to change that. There's a constitutional way to go about changing the Constitution, and that isn't by legislators making laws. And we start talking about getting the, getting the, uh, the schools safe. That's easy. Make it a hard target. You know, when schools are a soft target, that's a problem. Right now, there's over a trillion dollars still, $1.2 trillion that's left over for COVID money. We could take that money and move it to the schools and secure the schools. First of all, make sure you have bulletproof glass on the outside windows. Make sure you have one entry point. You have a gap between where you have a soft door where they come in. You have a buzz door to go in the, the other way. You make sure that the entrance that you go through can be locked down. Then you got to make sure that the emergency exits are always closed and if they're open, an alarm will sound. We can secure our schools easy if we choose to do it. And that's one role that the federal government can do. Thank you. We need to move on now, Mr. Shannon. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything that was said there, but I, I would add this. It start, this is a symptom of a much larger problem. The challenge we have in America, listen, assault rifles have been around for a really long time. Uh, we've had guns in our country for a really long time, and that's a good thing. But the violence that we've seen, that is new. And we've got to ask, why is the violence happening? And it is a symptom of a much larger problem. As I've said before, it is a breakdown in the family, in the family unit. We should get back to policies that are promoting strong families. If we want a strong America, if we want a strong Oklahoma, if you want a strong city, it starts with strong families. That's how we get back to restoring safety and sanity. And we should have more school choice. And as an advocate of school choice, I would say this, allowing parents to decide, that would create the competition within the public school system systems that would allow parents to have a stronger voice in their in their schools and that would bring about the change that we're talking about in keeping kids protected all right thank you both well a lot of you are watching online tonight and our Craig Day joins us now with what questions some viewers have tonight Craig 
Thanks, guys. We appreciate our viewers uh, sending in those questions. Keep them coming, and we'll try to get those questions answered. And to our two gentlemen here, thank you very much. We'll get right to one of the themes here tonight, and it's about divisiveness. I think many would agree that our country is very divided right now. Is there something that you would specifically do to improve the divisiveness in the United States? And are you willing to work with Democrats? And if so, which on what issues are you willing to work with them uh, to accomplish and we'll start with Mr. Mullen. You know just to the side of me you can see the flag here that's our starting point if you can tell me that you love the country as much as I do that's a starting point I don't care if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat but if you're wanting to change the foundation of this country like a lot of po career politicians on the Democrat side is wanting to do they're wanting they're wanting to change the foundation they literally wear a button on their lapel that says Socialist Democrat Party I'm sorry there's no room to work there but as far as reaching across the aisle and saying, hey, what can we do best for this country? Guys, I, I do that every day. We have a bipartisan workout that, that I lead when I'm in Washington, D.C. One, if you talk politics, you get to do burpees. But two, at the same time, we're trying to build some type of bond to say, can we put some of the differences aside and say, it's best that we talk so we can make sure our kids, which I, I have six of them, I'm kind of invested here, that we can have some type of future for our kids. It's possible, but the parties are so far apart that it's, 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 it's no longer just your mom and your dad's Republican or Democrat party. It's a party that the Democrats represent that's saying, hey, we want to go towards socialism, and the Republican Party is saying, no, we want to go towards more freedom. Mr. Shannon? Yeah, leadership is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. The problem we have in Washington, D.C. right now is we don't have real leaders. What we have are politicians who are more interested in the next election, not leading the American people. Listen, just because you disagree with me, that doesn't make you evil. That doesn't make you anti-American. What that makes you is wrong. That makes you wrong just because you disagree with me. But what I have found is when I was the Speaker of the House or whether it's in my current business, leading as the CEO of a bank, bringing people together that is a gift from God. That's a gift that I've been blessed with. Your ability to get people to buy into your ideas, to not just go and scream and shout and talk about how much you're fighting. You know, oftentimes the fights in Washington, D.C., uh, they look more like WWE fights where they're completely orchestrated because at the end of the day, nothing gets done, nothing gets accomplished, but the politicians, they come back to their state and they tell you nothing got done because we were fighting in Washington, D.C. We don't just need people that are willing to fight. We need people who are able to bring people together and to lead this country because that's what's lacking right now is a sense of leadership and it all starts with what made this country great it's capitalism it's con the Constitution and it's Christianity that's how we get leadership back to this country and I would love for people to buy into that it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat all right thank you both so right now we're gonna ask each candidate an individual question and we're gonna begin with mr. Mullen so when you ran for office in 2012 you made two separate term limits pledges first promising to leave Congress after three terms and then to co-sponsor the US term limits amendment to limit the number of years anybody can serve in the House or the Senate so um, since then you've run for fourth and fifth term so what do you want to say to the voters about that well I do agree in term limits but they need to apply to everybody the problem is, is when you just term limit the good guys, you leave Nancy Pelosi and you leave Chuck Schumer in place. That puts us at a disadvantage. And I have a lot more fight. You know, I was always taught you go into the fight. You walk into pressure. I didn't know what I didn't know. I'd never been involved in politics. My first political event I ever went to is one that I stood up and said, I'm, I'm, running, for, I'm running for office. And when you get up there, you start realizing, holy cow you can't do anything by yourself you can have these great ideas but unless you have uh, relationships unless you're able to get 200, uh, 218 people to agree with you you can't move and so when our time was coming towards an end i told my wife i said man we, i still got more fight in me as long as i can make a difference for oklahoma i want to be in that fight i want to make sure oklahoma values are represented every single day we need to be trying to influence washington dc and when good guys leave we allow Maxine Waters and, 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 and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden to, to influence us. They've been in office for 40 years. That's, we can't have that. We need to make sure we have somebody in place fighting for Oklahoma every day. Okay, now over to Mr. Shannon. And in a campaign ad for the United States Senate in 2014, you approved a message that said success comes from hard work, not handouts. 
and after you helped pass a work requirement for food stamp eligibility. You're quoted as saying, working takes care of a lot of problems. It's amazing what eight hours of hard work will do, how many social problems it takes care of. The best social program in the world is hard work. Minimum wage in Oklahoma has not gone up since 2009 and is still $7.25 an hour. OK Policy says one quarter of Oklahoma jobs are low wage. So Mr. Shannon, do you still stand behind those previous comments and should Oklahomans even receive welfare and will you push for social program reforms? I 100% stand behind my comments about the need to work. We have a work ethic problem in this country. Uh, we have too many people, and a lot of it's been caused, frankly, by the politicians in Washington, D.C., who have been, uh, you know, obsessed with getting people addicted to government. The problem with when you become addicted to government is you lose your, 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 your human dignity. It robs people of their human dignity. That's why I fought so hard my entire career, both in the private sector and in the public sector, to get people off of government. We shouldn't define compassion by the number of people we get on welfare. We should co define compassion by the number of people we get off of welfare. As it relates to minimum wage, listen, I'm an employer. I've been an employer for, for several decades now, and I will tell you, uh, finding good people to work is a tough thing to do. The market should drive what minimum wage is. I disagree with the premise of the question. Minimum wage has increased. You go anywhere in this, in, around this country right now, around this state, no one's making minimum wage anymore because there is a worker shortage right now in this country, right here in the United States of America. And so, no, we need to get the government out of deciding what minimum wage is. The market should drive the minimum wage. And when the market drives it, you will see an increase in pay, not a decrease. So now we want the candidates to ask each other a question. We're going to begin with Mr. Shannon. So what would you like to ask Mr. Mullen? Uh, that's a good question. We, we submitted we, the question already, I thought. We, we do, and uh, I believe we have the question. So the question we're going to ask. Yeah, but, I uh, remember. <laughs> I remember, but I was going to stumble through it, man. <laughs> the, the question is to Mr. Mullen from Mr. Shannon. Go ahead. So, Congressman, when you were in... Uh, first elected a decade ago, Barack Obama was president and the national debt was $16 trillion. Today, it is $30 trillion. So the question is, what legislation have you personally authored and signed into law to reduce spending, the deficit, or the national debt? You know, every year we pass a balanced budget. That's, that's what we come up with. It's supposed to be a balanced budget. But the gimmicks are, you have politicians that's doing that, and they say, a balanced budget that'll balance in 10 years, a balanced budget that's going to balance in 10 more years. And you never balance it because you don't have real business people up there. None of them have ever signed the front and the back of a paycheck. And when you start looking at trying to get legislation passed, you have career politicians that are saying, hold on, that's going to affect my that's going to affect my pet project in my district. That's going to affect what I do here. When you have something to come home to because you've actually created jobs for over 25 years, you've been creating jobs your whole entire life, that's what you do, you understand what it's like a balanced budget. You understand what it's like to struggle each day saying, can I make payroll? Can I make this gas payment? Can I make uh, th th my, my supply bills? And when you have individuals that have never been there, they don't understand it. And, and so when we have proposed legislation, it's never went anywhere. Because you have individuals that are sitting up there every single day trying to figure out how they can say they championed for their district instead of doing what's best for this country. And that's why you keep seeing the national debt rise over and over and over again. Okay, Mr. Mullen, your question for T.W. Shannon. During the Second World War, nearly 300,000 American troops lost their lives at the hands of a foreign aggressor in Eastern Europe. T.W., what similarities do you see between the 1940s and the current Russia-Ukraine war? What steps would you do to prevent the same loss? Yeah, this question sounds a little bit like a, uh, with all due respect, Congressman, it sounds like a way to justify the $40 billion that was sent to, to Ukraine uh, to, to secure their border and to arm their citizens while America's border remains open and there's a national debate about disarming Americans. Uh, the truth is I don't see very many similarities at all because at the time America was leading from strength. Right now America is not leading from a place of strength. That's the challenge that we have and unfortunately the politicians in Washington DC have been way too comfortable with just writing a check to bankroll Ukraine. Listen, I certainly believe that America has to lead and I think that Russia should be contained and I certainly think there should be efforts uh, you know, 
uniting our allies to do that. But the problem is just sending 40 billion, oh, by the way, it's now up to $53 billion. We sent that money over while Americans are right now pleading with our president of the United States is actually pleading around the world for people to ship in baby food as humanitarian aid because we can't feed our own children. It was a mistake to do it then. It's a mistake to do it now. We should be leading. We should not be following. And that's the problem with Washington, D.C. It's not America first. It's Washington, D.C. first. So, Mr. Mullen, since that comes directly at you, we'll give you 45 seconds to respond. You know, this is the problem when you have, when you have politicians who's been in office for, I don't know, over 10 years and now they're seeking another office, you have individuals that they make a political decision because we make decisions based on two things, the way you're raised and our life experiences. If, if my opponent would actually read the bill, he would understand that not one penny actually went directly to Ukraine. In fact, what it did is it replenished the munitions that we had spent because we had been in 20 years of war on terror and a lot of our weapons was out of date. We sent them to our partners in Europe and they sent their weapons to Ukraine. What we did is we spent money right here in Oklahoma with our munition plant in McAllister, replenishing and updating our weapon system. So not $1 of that $40, trillion, or that $40 billion was actually sent directly to Ukraine. But like I said, if you read the bill, you'd understand it. A rebuttal, 45 yeah. seconds, yes. Congressman, that is absolutely swamp talk. The idea that we, that, that we, yes, I have read the bill, and the, and okay, the truth is, the truth is, uh, a, a big, a big portion of that bill is going to directly to Ukraine. In fact, we don't know where about 16 trillion of it is going at all. The fact that we would have a bill that we call funding Ukraine, that the congressman as well as the rest of the politicians in Washington D.C. would rally the American people to spend 40 billion dollars, and then for you to stand on the stage tonight and say, "Oh no, it's not going to Ukraine." Yeah, it is going to Ukraine, and ultimately, if we're not careful, if we, if we're not successful. In Ukraine with what we're doing, it's actually going to go to Vladimir Putin. That's the bigger, that's the bigger uh, challenge that I think we should be prepared for. Again, this is Washington, D.C., double speak. Yeah, we spent $40 billion to send to Ukraine to secure their border while our borders open, and the truth is we're trying to disarm Americans while we're arming the Ukrainians. Well, let's, let's break that down. One more let's, let's break down what the, what the $40 billion did. One, it spent over $20 million replacing the ammunition. Two, it spent nearly $10 billion dollars to supply baby it, it formula spent in morally, America. It, it it's spent not an America first bill. That's the truth, Congressman. Back pain our military who went from being deployed to uh, Europe to being active and there was a shortage in wages that we had to pay for it. The rest of it went to the State Department because we had to increase the IC world, the intelligence community, because the gathering that had to take place because of Russians' aggressions. Once again, there is zero chance you read the bill because that, you would understand that, all that, that, that is that was absolutely swamp talk. What I know is Gentlemen. it didn't go to Oklahoma and it didn't go to the United States Excuse of America. Excuse us for we interrupting. Have we it have didn't to go end to it there. We, we, We're going to end it there. We and asked at the beginning to not interrupt each other, so just uh, we want everybody that to hear forward. your answers individually. We're going to move on at this point. We are to our next question. We're going to go back out to our nation's capital. Another question with Alex Cameron from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Alex. Thank you. In the lead up to the Supreme Court decision recently that overturned Roe versus Wade, Republicans argued the 1973 court had erred, that abortion should be decided at the state level. Generally, Republicans believe states are better able to make decisions on things that impact the people who live there than Washington is. But now that Roe has been actually overturned, there's talk of a national ban on abortion. In other words, letting Washington, not states, decide what to do about abortion. Would you vote for a federal ban on abortion and please explain your position? We begin with Mark Wayne Mullen. You know, um, absolutely I would. Someone's going to love that baby. You know, with, with a, a father of, of three adopted children, I can tell you there is no difference between those that we chose to bring in the family and those that came natural. We love, them, we love all six of them equally. And my fight is to make sure we protect every single baby out there. I'm, I commend our Oklahoma state legislators for having such a strong law. And I, I'm excited that we're going to actually end killing babies in Oklahoma. But babies in California and babies in Massachusetts are just as important. And so until we fight to save every single life and we make sure that we cherish the next world changers, the next entrepreneurs, the next game changers of this world, then my fight's not over. We can celebrate for a little bit. But give someone an opportunity. 
to love that child just like somebody loved you. Mr. Shannon? Yeah, I think the question was, would you support a federal ban on it? I will say, first of all, uh, I think the court got it right on overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, the conservative Donald Trump appointed court made the right decision in returning it to the states. The challenge is uh, we still have babies that are going to lose their life. I don't make a distinction between babies that are born and unborn. To me, they're all God's children, and they deserve our protection. That's the reason governments were protected. I don't know that a federal ban would be possible without a constitutional amendment, and I would support a constitutional amendment to protect life. Listen, it's the most important thing we do. It's why when I was Speaker of the House, I passed the first in the country uh, tax credit, $5,000 for foster care parents to ensure that we're doing our part, because I believe not only does life start at conception, uh, but civil rights start in the womb, and we should do everything we can to protect life. And we should make a distinction between children that are born and all, or, or that are born or unborn. They are all God's children. So this is a follow-up question to that, since both of you have clearly stated that you are pro-life. Do you believe in exceptions for rape or incest for abortions? What if that victim of rape or incest is a minor child? So, Mr. Shannon, we'll start with you. Yeah, for me, first of all, this is the worst scenario that a parent could actually imagine the rape of their child. And so we know that, unfortunately, this happens uh, in our nation. I'm a father. I have a 16-year-old daughter. And I can't imagine what any parent would be dealing, would be going through having to deal with such a, such a situation. But for me, uh, life starts at conception, and all life is valuable. Uh, what we should be having a national debate on is what do we do with the perpetrators who caused a, a, a young child to be impregnated? We should be going after that person, not the unborn child. And so for that reason, uh, I wouldn't support the exceptions. I believe very, very strongly uh, that we should be protecting the life of the mother and protecting the life of the child, and we should be holding accountable anybody who violates a child. That's where our energy should be focused, and we should protect life because, again, all life is, is valuable, uh, and it doesn't matter how, how, what a creep the dad may be, that life is still valuable. Okay. Mr. Mullen. As I stated before, um, th this, this child deserves someone to love them. And as, as I said, as a father of adopted children, regardless of how they enter this world, someone still can love that child. I get, I, I, I don't get, but I could understand the pain that a, 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 a that a family could go through in this circumstances, and it's very personal. But still yet, that's still a life. And uh, you can't make a distinction between them. That child didn't make this decision how they were conceived, and I get that the, that the victim didn't either. But that child can still have a full productive life. That child can still make a difference in this world. And we gotta make sure that we protect that child. And when it comes to the, the death of the mother, or, uh, or the child, I can tell you without question where my wife would be on this. There's no way my wife would set and say that my life is more important to our child. Just like I would lay my life down for my child in a heartbeat, my wife would do the same. So those are questions that I can't answer. It's gonna be between the, 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 the parents at that time, but I can tell you where my wife and I would be. Thank you both. Yeah. All right, we're moving on to another question. Both of you are tribal members, Mr. Shannon, a member of the Chickasaw Nation, and Mr. Mullen, a Cherokee citizen. The Supreme Court rulings on tribal jurisdiction have led to a lot of tension between tribes and state and federal government. So the Senate gives advice and consent to all treaties. So as a future member of the U.S. Senate, are you open to renegotiating a treaty that would settle some of these issues? Mr. Mullen, we're going to start with you. The only way you're going to reopen these treaties if the tribes and the state and the government all agree. That, that for, for, for Congress just to put their will into this, and they don't live in Indian country, where I've lived my entire life, uh, that's, that's, that's not the role. If we're going to make decisions on that treaty, that needs to be all parties agreeing to something. But I absolutely disagree with reopening it right now. It's, there's, and now, if you're going to refer this to McGirt, if that's the reason that you're, that you're moving down that road, then McGirt needs to be handled because the state and the tribes come together and they agree on an issue. They agree on something that they're gonna ask Congress to move forward because McGirt affects everybody, affects all of us. And regardless if you're a tribal member or you're not, at the end of the day, we're all Oklahomans and we've gotta do what's best for Oklahoma in this decision. But we don't want Congress making decisions for us here in Oklahoma. That's the worst thing we can do. As I said, we need to be influencing D.C., not allowing D.C. to influence us. Mr. Shannon? Mr. Shannon. 
The, the Constitution is pretty clear that it's Congress who has the, the ultimate decision about the fates of tribes in America. And I don't believe that the treaties have created the challenges that we see right now. The challenges that we see right now in Oklahoma as it relates to the tribes and the state getting along is because they're not even talking at the present time. We've got to get them in the room. They've got to come up with solutions, and it has to be an Oklahoma first solution. Uh, we've seen this happen time and time again, whether we're talking about compacts for, for, for gaming or we're talking about compacts for hunting and fishing or compacts for gasoline. Oklahoma has been a model for the rest of the union about how tribes and states can work together, and there's no reason that we can't do that uh, again. We've, we have been a model for that, uh, and we can, we can lead that effort again. It doesn't require a treaty reconsideration. The treaties aren't the problem at all. Tribes have been of a benefit to the state, but any, any challenges that we have, they have to be an Oklahoma first solution, and that starts with the tribes and the state working together. And, I would, and if it requires a, a codification by Congress as the senator, I'd be happy to carry that legislation, but it has to be an Oklahoma first solution first. Thank you both. We're going to head back to the nation's capital for another question with Alex Cameron from our D.C. Bureau. Alex. Thanks, Lori. You know, no president since Bill Clinton has balanced the federal budget. The two Republican presidents since Clinton have had between them six years where the GOP has had complete control of Congress. In other words, controlled both chambers like the Democrats have now. So why should voters believe the Republican Party is the party of fiscal responsibility any more than Democrats? We begin with T.W. Shannon. Yeah, I don't know that we can trust any politician in Washington, D.C. right now to balance our budget. We have out-of-control debt. We have out-of-control spending. We don't have a revenue problem in Washington. We have a spending problem in Washington, D.C. Uh, the truth is, and I want to back up on one point of the question, Alex, uh, it wasn't just Bill Clinton who balanced the budget. He actually had a Republican House and a Republican Senate, and he actually voted against the balanced budget three times before it was forward. So, yeah, we can trust conservatives, but we've got to have people in the party who will stand up and push back against the party bosses. The reason I run it for the United States Senate is because we need someone from Oklahoma who will not only push back against Democrats, but who will also push back against their own party. People like Kevin McCarthy, people uh, like the Senate leader Mitch McConnell, who have continued to side with the Democrats, whether we're talking about the $40 billion that we're bankrolling to Ukraine, or we're talking about the out-of-control spending that has seen America's decline around the world. We need conservatives who will stand up and do exactly what we did in Oklahoma, where we balanced our budget, where we reduced debt, where we reduced spending, where we reduced the size of government, we reformed welfare. That's what we need in, in Washington, D.C., not another politician who's willing to go along just to get along. Mr. Mullen. You're never going to change Washington, D.C. if you send the same type of resume over there over and over again. Someone that went to law school and then they ran for the state house and then became leadership inside the state house. At the same time, I was setting back building businesses, building, creating jobs that politicians want to talk about. If you're ever going to change Washington, D.C., then you're going to have to start changing the resume you send there. When I first got to Washington, D.C., there was only one other current business operator there in other than myself. So if you've never balanced a budget in your personal life, your only identity is politics, that's your livelihood, that's the best job you've ever had, that's a problem. You're going to do whatever it takes to protect it. You're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that that atmosphere that you're in is well suited. The problem that you have is if you've never truly understood how to make payroll yourself, how to pay off debt, you're never going to do it when you finally get into office either. That's why I say you have to send more business people to Washington, D.C., and less career politicians. Mr. Shannon, you want 45 seconds to respond to that? Sure, happy to. Um, I, I'll tell you, Congressman, you mentioned going to law school. I'm very proud of the education that I received. I was the first person in my family to go to law school, and I think it's given me a real perspective about how to address real issues. Because what I see happening in Washington, D.C., over and over again, I see people coming back to their state telling you everything that's wrong with Washington, but they can't tell you one thing that they've done to fix it. We have a problem in this country right now, and it is career politicians, people who go to Washington, D.C., and they can come back and tell you everything that's wrong, but they can't tell you what they've done to fix the problem. If we're not careful, we're a couple elections away from losing this country. We've, 
we don't just need someone who'll stand up and tell you they're fighting. There's plenty of fights going on in Washington, D.C. We need someone who can disrupt the process. And that means not just calling out what's wrong with Democrats, but calling out people in your own party. Because we've got Republicans who are just as bad at spending as the Democrats are. Republicans spend just as much. They just tell you they feel guilty about it. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on now because, as you know, the winner of the runoff will face Kendra Horn, um, Independent Ray Woods, and Libertarian Robert Murphy in the general election in November. So why would you be the best Republican candidate to win this race? Mr. Mullen. It's easy. Resumes matter, as I said. If you want to actually take the fight to Washington, D.C., you've got to start with what have you done in your past. If you've always wanted to seek an office, if that's your job, then you're gonna do whatever it takes to get there. If you wanna see a comparison between the two, then start looking at what they've done in their past. What have they created? What have they actually done for the state of Oklahoma? How are they actually gonna represent Oklahoma values, true Oklahoma values, and take it to Washington, D.C.? I think my resume, without question, will line up complete contrast to what Kendra Horn has. Not to mention, Kendra Horn, she's pro-choice. I'm obviously pro-life. She believes in supporting Nancy Pelosi and the leadership. Me, I've never even met Mitch McConnell. I don't think he necessarily represents Oklahoma values. As I've said, we need to make sure we're not allowing Washington, D.C. influencing us. We need to make sure Oklahoma values are being represented in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Mr. Shannon. Yeah, listen, who we send to Washington, D.C. matters. We're a small state. We only get to send seven people. States like California, New York, and even Texas get to send dozens of people. The people that we send to represent us, they have to be champions of everybody from Oklahoma, not just a champion of Washington, D.C. What separates me and anybody else in this race is a skill set of actually accomplishment in getting things done. When I was Speaker of the House, we balanced the budget here in Oklahoma. We reduced taxes. We actually led the effort to reform welfare. We actually uh, re reformed workers' compensation here in Oklahoma. We did that at the Oklahoma legislature. What we need is not someone who can just talk about what's wrong. We need someone who can go to Washington and actually get things done. I have a skill set that's different than anybody else in this race. I've worked across party lines. I've gotten people to buy into my ideas. Leadership is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it, not just telling you what's wrong and what the problem is. And that's the problem with Washington, D.C. right now. Real quick, we want to give you guys one more question before we get to closing remarks, and this is on immigration. How do we fix immigration in this policy? And we're trying to get you guys to keep the 30 seconds on the response. And uh, we'll begin with you, Mr. Mullen. 30 seconds, secure the border. You have to secure the border. Before you can talk about immigration reform, you have to secu secure the border. So finish the wall. That's why President Trump endorsed me, because he knows, without question, I'm going to fight to finish his wall. Mr. Shannon. Yeah, I'll, certainly we've got to secure our border. We had 2.5 million people come into our country illegally last year, but we need to also go a step further. Yes, we need to finish the wall, but we also need to end birthright citizenship. Uh, birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment was never intended for illegals who break our laws and come into our country illegally. It was intended for the descendants of slaves, people that were born in this country. We need to remove the welfare benefits that the politicians in Washington, D.C. keep handing out. You know, Republicans and Democrats say they're different on this issue, but the truth is Republicans have enjoyed the cheap labor and the Democrats have enjoyed the free illegal votes. Okay, we promised two minutes each for your closing remarks and we want to make sure we have time for that. So we are going to begin with closings for Mr. Mullen. You know, you're never going to change anything you're willing to tolerate. And I got tired of seeing what was happening to my company each and every day. The biggest threat I had in our companies that my wife and I had the privilege of, of running for almost 25 years, it wasn't my competition. It wasn't my fact that the fact that I could hire and I could actually fire right too. It was the fact that I was fighting faceless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. over and over again. And until they came knocking on my door in 2011, politics had never entered my mind. But I got fed up. And that's why I showed up at my first ever elect, uh, uh, campaign event, and I said, I'm running for office. At the time, I didn't even know how to tie a tie. But I knew I wasn't willing to set back. And right now, we have the biggest threat facing our country that we've had. We truly have a movement to move us to a socialist country. The Democrats have, have laid their cards on the table. They're trying to take over our economy. They're trying to take over our health care, and they're trying to take over our education. As I've stated before, no one is going to fight harder than someone with firsthand knowledge. 
I have six kids in the public school system. I have hundreds of employees across the state of Oklahoma. I fight this problem every single day. And this isn't a time for any of us to be silent. It's time for us to get up and fight harder than we ever have because my kids and your kids depend on it. I ask for your vote August 23rd. And Mr. Shannon? To Ms. Kew. This state and this country have been very, very good to me. By the time I was 40 years old, I'm 44 today, I was able to finish law school and college. I was able to work for two members of Congress. I had a chance to serve in the Oklahoma legislature when I was 27. And by the time I was 33, I was elected by my colleagues to be speaker. And today I get to be the CEO of a bank. That story only happens in the United States of America. It cannot and does not happen anywhere else. But we have to perpetuate that story. And because of the narrative coming out of Washington, D.C., by both the Republicans and Democrats, it would appear that you have to be, in order to be successful in America, you have to come from a specific zip code or a specific background. That's a lie. America is not the home of systemic racism. It is the home of systemic opportunity. But we have to keep it that way. If we're going to make America great again, it starts with three things. It's the Constitution, it's capitalism, and it's Christianity. That's how we make America great again. Listen, things are bad right now, but they can get better with the right leadership in Washington, D.C. And there, while there's so much darkness out there, we can also see some light. Even in the failed Afghanistan pullout, we saw people literally clinging on to the wings of airplanes to try to get to America. We saw a mother handing her newborn child to a guy she had never met before who had an M16 on his hip, and the only thing she knew about him was that he had the old red, white, and blue on his shoulder. And that was enough for her to know if her kid could just get to this place that we call home and the rest of the world calls America, that child could have the most amazing life any child's ever had. The only way we're going to keep it that way is if we have politicians from Washington, D.C. who come home and do exactly what they say they're going to do and allow working Americans to go serve. This, the, our founding fathers never intended for people to be career politicians. They intended for it to be a working legislature, a citizen legislature. I'm running for the United States Senate because I have a skill set that I think can make a difference. Better than anybody else in this race, I have a record of actually pulling people together and getting things done, not for myself, not for my own ego, but for the people of Oklahoma. And that's exactly what I want to do for you in the United States Senate. I ask for your vote. My website is TW for Senate, and I'd love to have your vote August 23rd. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shannon, Mr. Mullen. Thank you both for scheduling time to be here for this live debate. And thank you at home as well for... Uh, your questions and your support tonight and being interested in this election. Yes, the primary uh, runoff date, August 23rd, so get out there and vote. And of course, the winner of this race faces Democratic, Independent, and Libertarian candidates. That election, the general election, is November 8th. Of course, we'll see you back here tonight for the news at 10 o'clock. Thanks again for joining us. Good night, everybody. Good night. Mark Wayne Mullen announced on social media former President Donald Trump endorsing him for the Oklahoma U.S. Senate race. Trump said in the post, quote, Mullen is an